And welcome to the show, Susie Wiles. Susie, thanks for giving us some New Zealander of the Year. I don't think I've said that since the award actually happened, Susie. Susie Wiles, thanks for joining us, mate. Oh, thank you. Um, Not the current New Zealander of the Year. We obviously have a new one now. <laughs> oh, but what happens? Do you have to give your crown back at the end of the year? What, <laughs> what, how does that work? There was no crown. <laughs> and I, I'm reliably told we remain, uh, you know, uh, of the alumni. <laughs> if it, uh, as a side note, I mean, I don't know if you've done this personally, but some people put that kind of thing on their CV or on their email signature or whatever. Did, is it the kind of thing that people leave in there now? Or does it have to be like former New Zealander of the Year? <laughs> no, you put the year that you were New yeah, Zealander right. of the Year, I think. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. I mean, congratulations for, for that whole thing anyway. But anyway, let's um let's get on to um, the news from yesterday that the government has decided to move to orange uh, yes. with the COVID outbreak. Now, um, I want to talk to you a little bit at some stage about us, us here in the Deep South and where mm -hmm. we're at versus other parts of the country because I'm a bit disappointed that the whole country has gone to orange, yeah. but you're the expert. I'm just the buffhead with a microphone. So tell us your <laughs> thoughts at the moment about uh, New Zealand going to orange yesterday. Yeah, look, um, you know, new, so our outbreak as a whole um, is definitely cases are dropping and hospitalizations are dropping. But we know that different places are slightly different, um, you know, different places in their in their outbreak. So Auckland and many other places have peaked and are coming down. But as you say, down south, that's not the case. And in fact, um, it, possibly not even having reached the peak yet. So it really doesn't seem the right time um, to have made that call. And I did see uh, some some messages on social media from one of the district health boards down there, basically saying, you know, please be careful. Cases are rising. Our hospitals are really stretched. Uh, you know, so it it does seem a decision that's been about the Easter holidays, about hospitality, about all of the you know all of the 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 people who are pressuring to to have um you know this kind of idea of getting back to normal and living with COVID. Yeah. Um, and actually, that's you know, this is living with COVID, right? We've got a new infectious disease uh, that's that's here. Um, and we don't live with it by ignoring it, right? We actually live with it by having appropriate public health, um, you know, protections in place. Uh, and so I think it should have been, you know, different levels for different parts of the country. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Susie, but <laughs> what I hear you saying is that there's politics involved in this, not just good public health measure now i don't know if you can actually say that from your position but that's what i hear when you say that look it's really clear that the government have to take in or they do take in many many different um you know positions when making their decisions right so they've got public health uh giving them advice they've got um you know they've got active lobbying <laughs> through the media and and through you know I mean, we've seen how many stories have we seen from hospitality saying, you know, get rid of all restrictions, right, or for, or other groups. So they are obviously balancing a lot of different requirements, mm. um, or a lot of different needs, a lot of different voices. Uh, and you know, it's not. I, I'm really glad I don't have to make those decisions, right? Because what <laughs> I'm thinking of is public health. I'm thinking of the the impact of the virus, and I'm really thinking about the long term impact of the virus, right? You know, I don't think we are talking about that enough. There's a huge amount of uncertainty at the moment, right? We know from the um, from you know from the previous bits of the pandemic that there are people who, even if they get a mild infection, will go on to have some you know symptoms that, for some people, are, are lasting you know a couple of years after they have been infected, right? And so you know this this idea of long COVID, of people having, you know, chronic fatigue, of uh, people having an impact on their heart, on their brains. You know, we don't know how much that will happen to people who've had Omicron and how much that will happen to people who've been vaccinated. Um, and so we're still in this really uncertain phase where I would like us to be being more cautious because this is likely, you know, globally to be one of the most disabling things that the world has ever experienced. And they, you know, we're kind of like storing up problems for the next 5, 10, 20 years. You know, I just, the sheer, the sheer number of people who've been infected now, but in New Zealand, but, you know, globally, you know, even if just 1% of those people um, end up with chronic fatigue and can no longer work, I mean, that's a massive impact, you know, yeah. globally on productivity, on people's, you know, uh, lives and livelihoods. Um, we need to talk about that and we need to plan for it. 
Yeah, I'm. Um, I, as you're talking, I always go, oh, "What about this? What about this? What about this one?" So I'll see if I can follow all my trains through. Because the first thing I thought was the research that I've read, just as a consumer of content and then passing it on with no expertise about the number of mild cases moving into long COVID, is one of those things. Um, I, I wanted to show people if they're not quite aware around the country what we're talking about when it comes to the South. This is an article from yesterday's ODT talking about we're having spikes at the moment in Dunedin. We're currently in the Southern DHB have, I think we're 7% of the population, but we have over 12% of the cases. So when I look at those numbers, I kind of go, I really would have personally liked to have seen, uh, so like my 15 year olds at school today, and I know that there's going to be pressure at school today from some of the people going, well, why the fuck are you wearing masks? We don't have to wear masks anymore. We're wearing masks. And I'm like, so I just said to her today, look, I almost was like, take a day off school. You know, you can take a day off, it's fine, but I didn't. But I'm like, I'm like, the holidays are at the end of today. I mean, even if they had have done 11.59 tonight, I was like, that would have been something that would have given, I think, some places a, a bit more of a break. But here's something else that I saw. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming you know Sci Time with Tracy. You've seen the TikTok Sci Time with Tracy. She's a, a, a scientist out of America who's been talking about COVID. She's got a lot of profile for doing it. She put this up the other day. This is just talking to the overall um, issue. Uh, this is a screenshot that I took from her uh, TikTok. Now, uh, this strikes home close to me because my father in 1948 caught polio, right? So I'm I'm with it on polio. This is the numbers that she's put out. And she's got uh, uh, citations and links to all of these things because we all think about things like polio and stuff being terrible and being, you know, mm. being a really bad disease. So if you can't quite see it, I'll read it to people if you're watching on a smaller device. Of ten, This is of 10,000 infected people, right? Of those 10,000 infected people, asymptomatic and polio was 7,000. It's 4,000 for COVID. Mild symptoms were 2,400. It's 4,800 for COVID. Severe symptoms was 500 for polio, 840 for COVID. Um, critical, dis uh, critical disease with 50 for polio, 300 for COVID. Fatalities were 10 for polio, 120 for COVID. And post-infection syndrome, which is the long COVID that we're talking about, was 20 for polio and over 1,500 for COVID. Now, those numbers might be slightly different in the US. Obviously, they've got a different system and stuff. But that I see that kind of stuff and I go, oh, orange for a few more weeks, another week, a little bit longer, just to let the peak, for example, in Southern to, to pass away would have been much what I preferred. Same. <laughs> You know, and and I think the other thing that's been really unhelpful um, has been people not really understanding why it's important to keep masks in some contexts, even when it's okay to go and, you know, be dancing on a dance floor without a mask on, right? Because yeah. there are people who we know are going to be, you know, who are more vulnerable to having a serious infection. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, they're not going to be going to a dance floor, but they are going to need to go to the supermarket. They are going to need to go, um, you know, shopping. And, and they should be able to do those things more safely. And so the reason, the, the way we make that safer is by everybody wearing a mask, right? Because if you're the person who was out dancing and you have got COVID and you don't yet realize it, well, then, you know, then, then you're going to be infectious and wearing a mask will help reduce the amount of virus that you're putting in the air. Um, so I think when, you know, the cons on this have been <laughs> terrible, right? People saying, I don't understand. Why can we do this really high risk thing? But this thing that seems to me really low risk, it's like, well, yeah. risk's not the same for everybody. And and in as, as we've moved into this, um, this new kind of scenario, which is everybody's supposed to make up their own mind about how much risk they're either at or how much risk they're willing to take. Well, not every, you know, there's going to be people who are high risk and who, it, you know, they need to do these things, right? And so that's kind of what I want to see is I want to see much more of an, of an appreciation and an understanding that when we talk about individual risk, actually, it, that's a really hard thing because we are making things more risky for some people. And there are ways to make those environments safer by all of us doing something simple like wearing a mask. Yeah. Look, I mean, that was one of my questions. Here's the here's the article I brought up to ask you about it, because it did seem a bit silly. But as you explain it, you know, all the 20 year olds at the nightclub is very different from the 80 year olds at the supermarket. You, you kind of go, OK, there's there's I can see what there is behind it. Hey, I wanted to ask you another question, because your uh, profile in this world is, is pretty high. I mean, there's you and there's Michael Baker seem to be two of the people that the media speaks to a lot. I think also that um, 
I guess what I'm trying to say, and I'm trying to think of a way to say <laughs> to ask this that doesn't sound disrespectful because it's not. I'm trying to say um, you're a pe- no, but you're a person who's up the front. Uh, okay, so what I'm thinking is, <laughs> I say you seem to get wheeled out. That's the bit that seems disrespectful. I don't I don't mean it to be. I'm just trying to say you. It's almost like when the government needs or wants or Jacinda wants a photo op or 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 whatever. I, I'm wondering about how you feel when perhaps you're involved in situations when let's say the government or a or a person of profile within the government you know wants to have you alongside them or whatever because you guys are speaking with one voice what about these times when you're kind of disagreeing with the what actually has happened do you have you got an opportunity to communicate this to the people who are making those decisions do you have enough kind of push through so you can you, you can kind of say to them well I, when we talk because we're agreeing we also need to talk when we don't agree and this is why do you get those opportunities so i think maybe you and others are misunderstanding both my role and actually how things play out in the media so okay. you know i um so i write a lot right i put all my thoughts down um i can uh you know i can make my feelings about things known um through for example you know the chief science advisors so there are lots of ways that we can get our voices to the government so i don't sit on any official boards you know yeah. i don't get called by by the prime minister you know to say right you know give me your opinion on this you know in the early days of the pandemic there were things that i helped her understand through the science the same as i've helped um, other ministers and i made that offer to all parties right if you want to understand the science i'm happy to do that yeah, yeah. so when you see me being um interviewed in the media i'm not being i'm not being put there by the government right i understand I'm that yeah, yeah because the media you know know that i'm able to under, uh, i'm able to help explain what is the science behind um behind the pandemic and i think the thing that's really really clear is that we can take the same science the same evidence and we can make different recommendations or or um suggestions based on what it is that we're trying to achieve and what and the suggestions being made by me at the beginning of the pandemic you know we're very much in line with what the government were doing and now we're changing because i have a very different idea of how i think we should be playing this living with covid game you know yeah. versus um what the government is doing you know it seems clear to me that they're trying to maintain sort of social cohesion they're trying to keep um hospitalizations low me i want a world where those who are immunocompromised can do the same things that everyone else is doing uh you know and not kind of stuck at home so I think it's, you know, and I, and I make my feelings really clear, right? I, I make them clear on social media. I write about them. Um, so I think it's not, you know, and, and it's really, I find it absolutely fascinating that people kind of think that I'm a kind of a shill for the Labour government. It's yeah, like you haven't so, listened to anything yeah, I've said. You haven't I guess not, I'm not, I've yeah. I guess I wasn't right. trying to, that's why I guess I was trying, struggling for the words. I, I guess I wasn't <laughs> trying to say you're an official spokesperson, but it's, I mean, I guess the impression I get, and maybe this was the wrong bit, was that you that there are connections between you and the prime minister or you and the government, maybe not officially. Um, like you said, at the start, you had some connection. To I guess what I'm asking is, is there a secret kind of Facebook messaging group? And what are you saying in there? Maybe that's what I'm asking. <laughs> hey, look, um, thank, well, no, this, no, this, this is, say, I've made really clear that what I say, you know, any advice that I'm willing to give, I am give, would give it freely to anyone. I have yeah. made that offer to the opposition leaders you know um and i and i find it really interesting that when when my advice um aligns with the government i'm kind of called a shill and when it doesn't yeah, yeah. you know when you just was really quiet like you know yeah. i was one of the people who appeared um at the waitangi tribunal against the government and that was kept really quiet. like nobody suddenly went oh there's susie wells yelling at the government for being inequitable um so it's kind of really interesting how we as experts who become public figures are then kind of used yeah. by people, you know, as kind of almost like weapons. You know, it's been, you know, me, myself personally, I've obviously been the subject of multiple smear campaigns because somehow it's seen that being able to damage my reputation will be beneficial, right? So um, it's a really weird place to get caught up in because I feel like I've been extremely transparent about where I get my evidence from, you know, about yep. explaining what the the all the data is showing. And what I think we should be doing based on what I value and how I would like New Zealand to be. Can we just finish with, and I, you've, you've kind of already said this, but it'll be good to, uh, you know, seeing everyone can, all, always want sort of morsel bite-sized pieces of content <laughs> to really nutshell, now that we're in orange, as citizens, what should we be doing? So, you know, if you haven't had your vaccinated, 
please wear a mask in uh, certainly um, in the places where it's required, but actually, you know, in other places too. Think of those, um, think of these public health measures as things that enable other people to do the things that you take for granted, right? Yes, it's perfectly safe for you to go to the supermarket, but it isn't safe for everyone else or for other people if, mm. you know, if you aren't wearing a mask. So kind of do those those things, please. Um, and while masking is not required in schools now, you know, really, really encourage it, right? This is This is another environment where children and staff need to be and some of those children and staff will be immunocompromised and they need us all to wear a mask to protect them. Susie, thanks for giving us some time this morning. Really appreciate your insights. Uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. And um, have an amazing, uh, hopefully you've got some time off over Easter. You're taking a break? I am taking a break. It'll be my first proper break in two years. So I am I am not <laughs> responding to anything. I'm turning off my email. Um, I, I definitely need a break. Um, do yeah, you, and I do hope you have everyone to, else will Do you have to wear like a big hat or dye your hair? when you're trying to have a weekend off so people don't recognize you from 300 meters away? Oh, look, I'll just stay home. <laughs> uh, oh, what do they call that? A, a staycation. Staycation yeah. this weekend? Yeah, staycation forever, basically. <laughs> Very good. Hey, uh, Susie Wells, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for your insight. Thanks a lot.